love right here on VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Novak and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Novak. Afghanistan's new Taliban rulers say they want education and jobs for women. A top Taliban leader expressed that idea while talking with the Associated Press, or AP, recently. He said the group seeks to earn the world's mercy and compassion to help millions of Afghans in need. Afghan Foreign Minister Amir Khan Mutaki also told the AP that the Taliban government wants good relations with all countries. He said it has no problem with the United States. He urged the United States and other nations to release up to $10 billion that were frozen when the Taliban took power. The Taliban took control of Kabul on August 15th when the earlier Afghan government fled the country. Sanctions against Afghanistan would not have any benefit, Mutaki said from Kabul on Sunday. Making Afghanistan unstable or having a weak Afghan government is not in the interest of anyone, he added. His assistants include workers from earlier governments as well as Taliban fighters. Mutaki said he understood the world's anger over limits on girls' education and on women in the workforce. In many parts of Afghanistan, female students between grades 7 and 12 have not been permitted to go to school since the Taliban took over. Many female government workers have been told to stay home. Taliban officials have said they need time to create schools and workplaces which separate women and men to meet Islamic rules. The Taliban first ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001. The group barred girls and women from schools and jobs. They also banned most entertainment and sports and carried out executions in front of large crowds. But Mutaki said the Taliban has changed since it last ruled. Mutaki said that under the new Taliban government, Girls are going to school all the way through grade 12. He said the gains are taking place in 10 of the country's 34 provinces. Private schools and colleges are operating as they were before the Taliban took power. And all women who had held jobs in health care are working again. This shows that we are committed in principle to women participation, he said. He said the Taliban has not targeted its opponents. Leaders of the earlier government live without threat in Kabul, he said. Most of them, however, have fled. Last month, the international group Human Rights Watch published a report that said the Taliban killed or caused more than 100 former police and intelligence officials to disappear. However, there have been no reports of mass acts of punishment. He said the Taliban made mistakes in their first months in power and promised to make reforms to help the nation. He did not tell the AP what the mistakes were or what the possible reforms could be. Mutaki disputed comments by U.S. General Frank McKenzie. He said that the terror group Al-Qaeda has gotten more powerful in Afghanistan since the Americans left. Mackenzie is America's top military official in the Middle East. The Taliban promised in a February 2020 agreement that it would fight terrorism if U.S. troops left the country. 
Mutaki said Sunday that the Taliban have kept that promise. Unfortunately, there are always allegations against the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, but there is no proof, Mutaki said. Militants from the Islamic State group have been carrying out more attacks on the Taliban and religious minorities in the past four months. Mutaki said he does not think the Taliban would cooperate with the U.S. in a battle against the Islamic State group. However, he said he hopes that with time, the U.S. will see a Taliban-ruled Afghanistan as a benefit to the U.S. America will slowly, slowly change its policy toward Afghanistan, he said. I'm Dan Novak of dogs recently gathered in Nigeria's business capital of Lagos. They wore things meant for humans, colorful school clothes, sunglasses, and even book bags. The dogs were taking part in the third ever Lagos Dog Carnival. Organizers of the event called it bigger and better than ever. This year, the carnival's theme was back to school. Jackie Idimogu is the organizer of the event. She said the purpose is to bring together dog owners, to celebrate their dogs, and learn from each other how to take better care of them. This edition is bigger and better than the previous editions, and interestingly, the number of dogs that we have this year is over 250, which is double what we recorded last year, Idimogu told Reuters. At the event, the awards on offer included Head Boy for Cleanest School Uniform, Punctuality Prefect, and Most Noisemaker. Being punctual means arriving on time. Canada, a white-haired golden retriever, was named Head Boy. He wore a bright green uniform with stripes and a school bag. Ivory, a bulldog, walked away with the Punctuality Award for arriving first at the carnival. For barking throughout the event, a golden retriever named Oscar took the Noisemaker Award. There was even a special appearance by a cat. The animal received an Attendance Award. Idimogu said the event has helped raise awareness on keeping dogs as pets. She said there are plans to take the event to other cities across Nigeria in the future. California's Stanford University has launched its first class taught fully with virtual reality, or VR, technology. Virtual reality involves the creation of digital environments that can be entered and controlled by humans. People use a headset that permits them to see virtual settings and objects along with electronic controllers to experience VR environments. The new class, or course, is called Virtual People. It is taught by Jeremy Balenson, a professor of communication. Balenson came up with the idea after teaching students about VR for nearly 20 years. During that time, he saw the technology continue to develop 
and decided the best way to demonstrate its abilities was to create a full course experience with VR. The class covers the expanding influence of VR in many different fields, including popular culture, engineering, behavioral science, and communication. The official course description reads, Each week, the course centers on different areas where VR can be used in the real world. The course includes times when students have individual VR experiences, as well as times when the whole class enters a VR environment at the same time. In Virtual People, the students don't just get to try VR a handful of times. VR becomes the medium they rely on. Professor Balenson said in a statement. He added, To the best of my knowledge, nobody has networked hundreds of students with VR headsets for months at a time in the history of virtual reality, or even in the history of teaching. Each student received an Oculus Quest 2 headset to use throughout the course. Facebook's parent company, Meta, created the Quest device. Meta has said such headsets will play a big part in a future metaverse it plans to build with other companies. The university says that during 2021, two courses permitted 263 students to spend nearly 3,500 shared hours together in VR environments. The course description says students can virtually take field trips, hold group discussions, and even take part in live music events and other performances. In addition to the headsets, the course also needed software to connect the students and teachers. For this, Balenson said the university decided to use the Engage Virtual Communication System. Engage is used by major companies and educational organizations to hold virtual meetings and events. Cyan DeVoe is a doctoral student at Stanford who serves as a teaching assistant for the class. She told the Stanford Daily that VR permits people to imagine the impossible. Among class exercises was a guided meditation in outer space, DeVoe said. Students were also able to create performances with different avatars and build unusual settings on their own. Alison Letier took the class before graduating in the field of computer science. She said that in the past she mostly thought of VR as being linked to video games but she said the course taught her valuable information about the technology that she might be able to use in her career. Letier said one exercise was particularly helpful. It permitted students to virtually walk in someone else's shoes. She said this could help her better understand the needs some people have with accessibility in technology. Sophie Marie Wallace is a student majoring in science, technology, and society. She said the class helped her connect to virtual experiences that led her to discover a new area of interest, using VR to improve sports performance in both land and water sports.
The course is part of a study being carried out by Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. The study is looking at how virtual technologies can be effectively used in educational settings. Balenson and DeVoe plan to use data from the class to examine differences in behavior in virtual environments. They hope the data can be used to help understand these differences and lead to an expansion of VR technologies in education. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. During the 1800s, the federal government forced Native American Indians to live in special areas. These were called reservations. The Indians no longer could move freely over the Great Plains to hunt buffalo. White men were settling there. The situation resulted in violence. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe continue the story of these Western wars. The government sent soldiers to force the Indians to move to reservations. But the soldiers could not keep them there. Groups of Indians would leave the reservations in the spring. They followed the buffalo across the plains. Some raided the homes of white settlers. They stole horses and cattle. At the end of the summer, the Indians would return to the reservations, and the government would give them food for the winter. As years passed, fewer Indians left the reservations to live the old life on the plains. It became difficult to find buffalo. The plains were becoming empty. Only a few years before, millions of buffalo lived on the Great Plains. Then railroads were built across the country. White men came to claim the grasslands. They put up fences. Cowboys came up from Texas with huge groups of cattle. They forced the buffalo away or killed them. The Indians tried to prevent this killing. Angry groups of Indians often attacked white buffalo hunters. But the army was too strong. Soldiers killed or captured many Indians. Finally, most Indians gave up the struggle. They surrendered their guns and horses. They went back to the reservations and became farmers. All this was taking place in what is now the south-central part of the United States. Far to the north, another struggle was taking place involving the great Sioux Indian tribe. The Sioux had signed a treaty with the government in 1868. The treaty gave them a large reservation in what is now Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wyoming. The Black Hills in Dakota were part of the reservation. These hills were important to the Sioux. In their religion, the Black Hills were a holy place. They were the center of their world, where the gods lived. They were the place where Indian fighters went to speak with the Great Spirit. He 
In 1873, the Black Hills suddenly became important to white men, too. Gold was discovered there. Treaties and religion meant nothing to the white miners who rushed to the Black Hills to search for gold. At first, the Indians killed some of the miners. They chased others away, but more miners came. The Sioux tribe asked the government to enforce the treaty. Tribal leaders asked the government to keep white men away from the reservation. The army sent soldiers to remove the miners. The soldiers ordered the miners to leave, but they made no effort to enforce the order. Again, the Indians protested. This time, the government sent officials to negotiate a new treaty. It asked the Sioux Indians to give up the Black Hills. Some of the Indian leaders refused to negotiate. One who rejected the invitation was Sitting Bull. I do not want to sell any land to the government, Chief Sitting Bull said. He held a little dust between his fingers. Not even this much. This resistance did not stop government efforts to get the Black Hills for the miners. The War Department sent General George Crook to punish the Indians and force them back to their reservation. Crook led a large force into Sioux country. He surprised an Indian village, capturing hundreds of horses. There was another clash a few months later. This time, the result was very different. The Indians gave the army its worst defeat in almost a century. The battle took place near the Little Bighorn River. General George Custer led 212 soldiers in search of the Indian leader Crazy Horse. As General Custer moved through the river valley, he sent men ahead to explore the area. His men returned with reports that thousands of Indians were waiting to attack. Custer refused to listen. He pushed forward. Soon his forces were surrounded by Indians. In less than an hour, the Indians killed the general and every one of his men. The white soldiers lay dead at Little Bighorn, and Custer's name would go down in history as a symbol of foolish pride in battle. The battle at Little Bighorn was a serious defeat for the United States Army. But the Indians' victory did not last long. Within a year, the army forced most of the Sioux to surrender. It took the Black Hills for the miners. It moved the Indians to a new reservation. In the next few years, the same thing happened to other Indian tribes throughout the West. Under great pressure from white settlers, the government took land from the Indians and opened it to settlement. The size of Indian reservations was reduced again and again. One by one, the Indian tribes of the West changed. Their fierce fighters became farmers who needed government help. They were weak and broken in spirit. One Indian leader named Black Elk described the situation best. 
He was a survivor of a battle at a place called Wounded Knee. Many Indian women and children had died there. Years later, Black Elk said, I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see the dead lying all over the ground, and I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried. A people's dream died there. Religion during this difficult time. An Indian religious leader named Wavoka gained influence. Wavoka declared that the Great Spirit had chosen him to prepare the Indians for a new world. He said the new world would arrive soon, and it would be a wonderful world. There would be no white men, he said, and all dead Indians would come back to life. Wavoka warned that new soil would rise up and cover the world like a flood. He said the Indians could escape destruction by dancing a special dance. It was called the Ghost Dance. Wavoka said the Ghost Dance would make Indians powerful. He said it would even protect them from bullets fired by the white men's guns. Thousands of Indians in the American West listened to Wavoka's message. They believed him, and they began to dance for long hours every day. On the Sioux reservations, all other activities stopped. Children no longer went to school. No one did anything but dance. All this frightened white officials. They tried to arrest some Indian leaders to stop the dancing. The arrests led to fighting, and the fighting led to a final battle in which the army defeated the Indians completely. The Indian wars were over. Wavoka himself told his followers, Our trails are covered with grass and sand. We cannot find them. Today I call upon you to travel a new trail. It is the only trail now open. The White Man's Road. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.